I am Carrie, one of the directors of Heartland Summer, as you know, here with Kate and Larry. Welcome to our final Meet the Authors event in this series. It's been a bit of a wild ride to see all of your faces on computer screens instead of in person, but I'm still so grateful for it. Booksellers have demonstrated such creativity and versatility since, Mar since March, and we are all inspired by that. I'd like to share an announcement and a request before we get started. All of us regional bookselling associations have teamed up to bring you two marquee authors during this fall trade show season. We're starting with the Reverend Al Sharpton on Tuesday, September 15th. Yep, that's right, the Reverend Al Sharpton. Please go ahead and do one important thing for us. Register for that event right now. With this marquee author, we need your early registration to ensure a successful event. And I think Larry is gonna pop that into the chat field. Uh, moving right along, we have a list of gems here today, so let's get started. Each of our 10 authors has five minutes to present their new or forthcoming book. We'll share a gallery request link as they present, so please don't be shy with your requests. And remember to ask questions or share comments in the chat field at any time. Uh, today's presentation is built in order around genre, starting with YA fiction. And our first title is The Way Past Winter. Karen Millwood Hargrave is a best-selling author and the winner of many awards for her books, The Girl of Ink and Stars, The Island at the End of the World, The Mercies, and The Deathless Girl. She lives in Oxford in the United Kingdom. She's here today to talk about The Way Past Winter, forthcoming from Chronicle Books on October 6th. It has a starred review from Booklist, and the best-selling author Tui T. Sutherland says the following. The story of strong sisters, a shape-shifting bear, eternal winter, parents' mistakes, and stolen children is captivating and impossible to put down. Please take us into this intriguing world, Kieran. Hi everyone, it's so lovely via the miracle of technology to be able to talk to you and obviously I would much rather be there having a wonderful holiday and meeting you all in person but, but this is pretty good. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about what is my third book out in the States but my first with Chronicle, The Way Past Winter and it is definitely my favourite that I've written so far. Um, it is follows three sisters, um, Mila, Sana and Pipa as they go on an adventure across an eternal winter to try and save their brother. Now Authors often talk about the different, difficult second album, the difficult second book. Mine was the difficult third book. I actually started The Way Past Winter as a title and a concept. And my title was The Winter Sisters. And I went through about three different iterations of this book before I finally found its heart. And it wasn't until I went back to some of my favorite books that I actually found that beating heart, that warmth that I was looking for. Um, I remember I was on uh, this island in Scotland called Harris and it was raining outside because it was Scotland and there was no internet, no TV. So I was turning back to some of my, my favorite classics and they included The Northern Lights or The Golden Compass as it's known in the States by Philip Pullman and The Wolf Wilder by Catherine Rundell and I realized that what my book had been missing was this was this snowy heart and I wanted to create an almost fairy tale like adventure that felt like it could have always existed but that could only have been written right at this moment so I wanted to write a really contemporary fairy tale and um, thanks to Taylor, I was able to dive deeper into this because it's been out for two years in the UK. And in that time, it's really sort of matured and become a lot more sweeping, a lot more about ecological themes. And I was really able with my editor Taylor at Chronicle to explore those themes and bring them out more in this new improved version for my readers in the States. So I, turn to Slavic fairy tales. And I've always been intrigued by those sort of very Baroque, dark Russian fairy tales. I love Deathless by Catherine M. Volante. I think that's an extraordinary book for older readers. And I wanted to create something that was really beautiful, but also really readable. So you could give it to someone who's maybe a more advanced reader um, in the sort of age 10 bracket, but that would engage readers right up through their teens and into adult books. So I want you to feel like you can pick up this book and really push it into anyone's hands. I want you to feel like this is a classic adventure that you can really trust. And in order to do that, I did try and give it this fairy tale like theme. And I'm gonna just drop my um, playlist into the comments because that 
is such a huge part of it for me. Atmosphere is everything in a book for me. And I think that's what all fairy tales share is that atmosphere, like you're just cozy, you're by a fire, you're gonna be told a really great story. So one of the stories that I encountered um, when I was writing this book was a really weird one called Koshkai the Deathless. And this is about a man who keeps his immortality on the head of a pin that's inside an egg, that's kept inside a chicken, that's kept inside a duck, that's then buried in a chest, that then is buried underneath an ancient oak tree, and that in itself is on an ancient island that floats and moves around. So when I heard that, I knew I wanted to play with this and bring it into, the, into our century, into a time when it will feel relatable and exciting for today's readers. And the way I did that was through my setting, through a forest. And here in the UK, we don't quite have the same scale as you do in the US, but we do have some extraordinary stretches of forest and woods. And I really wanted to evoke that love of the natural world in this book and maybe um, key into something that, that we maybe all feel when we're able to be outside and in nature. And I know that's been so important during lockdown to be transported, even if I couldn't go out myself and sort of be around those things. So I very much turn to books and to reading to allow that sort of escape in myself. And this book, it's, I suppose it has quite an epic scale. It's about a journey, these three sisters going on a mission to try and save their brother from forces outside their knowledge, outside their control. But it's also very much a domestic tale. And it really, I wanted to really focus on sibling rivalries and the family we choose as well as the family we have. And most of all, this is really Mila's story. This is about a girl who is realizing the world is so much bigger than she ever imagined. And that is both really terrifying and really wonderful. And it's about all that, that sort of terror and wonder of growing up and finding your place in the world and realizing that you can't really control it either, that there are just things sometimes that happen. But I wanted there very much to be a message of hope that you know it's within our power to choose our own path and self-determination is really important in this book because it sort of begins like you might feel like it hinges on fate but then it really turns and it's all about these three sisters deciding the path they're going to take and the choices that they're going to make and you can see that it's just an absolutely stunning package i love what chronicle have done um, they've got the O'Hara sisters to illustrate and um, do the calligraphy for it. So there are some beautiful um, parts in it and this is really special. Lauren O'Hara, who is the illustrator, actually sent me the um, original chapter header. You probably couldn't hear me then, but the original chapter header um, for the opening chapters. And I think it's so important to note that this is a collaboration from beginning to end, you know, with my editor, Taylor, and then producing this. Everyone at Chronicle worked so hard with Lauren. Um, and I'm going to drop her um, Instagram in as well if you want to go and check out her other work. Um, she and her sister, Natalie, are absolutely amazing. So do go check them out. And now I'm hoping left. that it's going to be a collaboration with you and that you will be able to take this to your readers, to your local community, be able to recommend it to teachers, librarians, and of course to children and really share this story. And I hope that it becomes a whole new thing um, through your engagement. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. That sounds just gorgeous and perfect for an upper Midwest winter. I'm going to take that one up. <laughs> Already preparing for that one this year. Um, I forgot to mention we're starting with YA fiction, so that's where we've begun. Moving, moving on to our second title, which is The Princess Will Save You. Uh, Sarah Henning is a recovering journalist who has worked for Palm Beach Post, Kansas City Star, and the Associated Press, among others. Her novels include Sea Witch and Throw Like a Girl. When not writing, she runs ultra marathons, hits the playground with her two kids, and hangs out with her husband, Justin, who doubles as her IT department. Released on July 7th by Macmillan's Torotine imprint, she's here today to talk about The Princess Will Save You. One of our booksellers, Emily Hall Schroen from Main Street Books in St. Charles, Missouri, just loved it. She says, a breakneck fantasy adventure with the most kick-ass heroine I've ever read. 
excuse me, I've read in months. <laughs> the Princess Will Save You is a strong contender for my favorite no novel of the year. Please take it away, Sarah. Thank you. Hi, guys. I'm so excited to be here to talk about The Princess Will Save You. Um, <laughs> like Carrie said in my introduction, um, my debut, Sea Witch, was in Indies, introduced in Indies Next um, pick. And I tell people that all the time because I love independent booksellers and I'm really, really proud of that. But I'm here to talk about this book, which is another YA fantasy. Um, the Princess Will Save You is my take on um, gender swapping, the damsel in distress trope, and it's inspired by The Princess Bride. It's not a retelling, it's inspired by, and I'll get to that a little bit later, but it is the story of Princess Amarande of Ardenia, which is a fantasy fairy tale kingdom, um, and she is the only daughter and heir to the kingdom, and her father, King Sindoa, dies mysteriously. Um, she believes he was murdered, other people think it's a heart attack, she's like, I don't think so, um, but the important part is that when he dies to gain her birthright kingdom, she must get married. And she is 16 and is like, no, I don't want to do this right now. And she believes every single suitor is probably somebody who could have murdered her father. Um, she doesn't think that she needs to get married to access what should be hers. And she's in love with her best friend, Luca, who is the um, castle stable boy and her best friend. And so of course, she puts up a stink and um, to sway her hand, Luca is kidnapped and she is blackmailed and deciding, or she decides that um, instead of playing the game, she's gonna go get him. So it's a quest tale um, that has all the, my favorite pieces of tales like that. And, you know, like the Princess Bride and fairy tales that it is, you know, kind of set upon. Um, but like I said, it's gender swap. So I wanted, to take the idea of, you know, making the male character the damsel, but the female heroine still has to um, struggle against the things that damsels have to deal with. This hyper patriarchal world, being considered maybe an object instead of a person, having your agency questioned and maybe squashed. Um, and so those are things that she deals with during this tale. And as far as the Princess Bride is concerned, again, inspired by, not a retelling, um, I love The Princess Bride. I am a child of the 80s, and so when I decided I wanted to tackle the damsel tale, the first person I think of is Buttercup. And not to spoil it for anybody, <laughs> if you haven't read the book or seen the movie, um, The Princess Bride, um, Princess Buttercup starts out as a commoner in love with her farm boy, Wesley, and she is fiery, and she goes to get him, and then he dies, or she thinks he dies, and she's squashed forever, and she's given this opportunity to become a princess and marry Prince Humperdinck, um, you know, being taken from a common birth and becoming a royal, which is supposedly what every girl wants, and it's not what she wants, and she fights back, and I think that that makes her an interesting damsel, but it also makes her frustrating, because toward the end of the book and the movie, um, when she marries Humperdinck, she is so distraught. She can't have true love anymore. She doesn't know where Wesley is. She just got married to this guy who's probably gonna try to murder her. Um, she secures a dagger and a private room and is like, you know what, I'm just gonna end it. She, you know, I know they're trying to telegraph her despair and being upset, um, but the buttercup earlier in the tale would have taken that dagger and used it. <laughs> she would have fought her way out of the kingdom and she would have gone to find Wesley and try to create her own happy ending. And so I wanted to take a damsel that would use a dagger the whole time <laughs> and go for what she wants. And, um, and that's what I did. So the uh, second book will come out next summer and I hope you guys read it. I really love it. The Art's Beautiful by Charlie Bar Bowater and um, hopefully it will look good on yourselves. Thank you for your time. Happy to be here. Thank you, Sarah. Looks delightful. Next up is Justin A. Reynolds. Justin A. Reynolds is the author of the critically acclaimed Opposite of Always and a co-founder of the Cleveland Reads Book Festival. His sophomore novel, Early Departures, releases on September 15th from Catherine Teagan Books, an imprint of Hachette. He lives in Cleveland with his family. Early Departures has garnered three starred reviews. Booklist says this charming wry novel packed with witty crackling banter is propulsively readable. Please tell us more about it, Justin. Thank you very much. So I'm Justin A. Reynolds. It's nice to meet everyone. 
Uh, here is the cover of Early Departures, if you haven't seen it. It's a beautiful cover done by uh, Stephanie Singleton. Uh, uh, and she actually did the cover for Opposite of Always. So we're, uh, we're lucky to get her again. So the story of Early Departures, um, if anyone, there was a letter that accompanied the uh, early, uh, the advanced reader copies. And essentially it comes from uh, a question that I had personally from my personal relationship. Um, Opposite of Always was born out of, out of some pain and uh, some, some grief that I was dealing with. I lost uh, one of my best friends, uh, I was 27 at the time, and I lost my aunt who was like my mom. And then at the time I was working as a registered nurse and I lost a patient who I had taken care of and I had gotten to know and befriended over the course of uh, almost three years. So it was a, a challenging time and out of that, um, kind of in, in a way of therapy, I guess, uh, Opposite of Always was born in this quest to try to save someone um, that you love from, from dying. And Early Departures is kind of a, kind of picks up where that story left off in the sense that uh, I, there's a one relationship I really wanted to, to kind of uh, pursue more in depth. And it's the story of two best friends. Um, so it's a story of Jamal and Quincy who are best friends and they're the kind of best friends where you imagine your entire life uh, knowing in your heart that this person will always be like front and center. Uh, you're going to live together, you're going to go to college together, you know, your, your kids are going to be best friends, that type of situation. Um, the kind of best friendship where you know that without question you are a better person, a better human being for knowing and having that person in your life. Uh, that was the way that I felt about, about my friend. And that's the way that these two feel about each other. They even make these videos uh, uh, because they both think that they're pretty funny, and they are, uh, called John C, which is obviously a, a combination of their names, where they perform kind of these sketch comedy uh, skits, and they tell jokes, and they interview people on the streets and get funny responses. And uh, Quincy especially has the dream of being a, a stand-up comedian, and he hopes that he'll be able to parlay that into being a talk show host, kind of like a Jimmy Fallon or on Arsenio Hall, and for them, the future is, is bright, never brighter. So then what happens when suddenly, inexplicably, all of that goes away, and not just in that sense of like, well, we've outgrown each other, uh, take care, I wish you all the best. No, what happens if that relationship burns to the ground in the worst possible ways, and then also takes the people and everything that you know and love along with it? What if suddenly the person who brought you the most joy in the world is now synonymous with the worst pain? And that's where Early Departures begins with two former best friends, now having been estranged for nearly two years, primarily because Jamal holds Q responsible for the most tragic incident in his life, that being the loss of his two parents in a terrible accident. And so they've barely spoken to each other uh, under the weight of, of, that, of that tragedy. But as fate would have it, they find themselves uh, reunited at a beach party, and finally they have it all out, and things boil over as we might expect. Uh, at the end of it, they go their separate ways once again, probably in their minds thinking this time for good, except as Jamal is exiting the party, he hears screams in the distance, and those screams lead him back to the water where he finds his former best friend drowning. Uh, Jamal manages with great effort to pull Q from the water, uh, thinking, hoping that he's rescued his friend uh, from this terrible fate, only to find out later at the hospital that Q has not made it, Q has passed, which is normally where the story would end. But fortunately, in this world, they live in a time in which a new healthcare technology exists called reanimation, and it allows you to bring the recently deceased back to life, provided they, they fit or qualify uh, and fit a host of criteria. Well, Q is gifted this procedure mysteriously by a donor. So now Q is going to live again. Except, of course, there is a catch. In fact, two. One is that this technology is relatively new. It's extremely expensive and also highly experimental. As such, to date, the longest they've ever reanimated someone and brought them back to life is 19 days, which means that in just a few short weeks, Q will die once again, which also means that Q's mom and the people that love Q the most will feel the loss of their, of their friend and her son once again. To make matters more complicated in order to effectively uh, reintroduce the reanimated person back to life, you kind of have to reset their, their brain uh, and their memory 
um, because of the trauma of their death would be so jarring that it would complicate the reanimation and make it prohibitive. And so they have to rewind or reset Q's brain to a time that predates the events that ultimately led to his death, meaning that when Q wakes up in the familiar setting of his bed, it will be just another day to him. He won't know that he's died, which means he doesn't know that in just a few short weeks, he will die again. And if you ask Q's mom, that's what's best because she doesn't want her son to have to spend the rest of his days wrestling with the weight of his mortality. But then Jamal, having now seen once again how frail life can be, sees this as an opportunity to make up for time lost, as an opportunity for redemption, a chance to finally get it right. Early Departures is an exploration of friendship, of sibling love, Jamal, and the relationship between his sister is, is for, uh, first and uh, foremost in this relationship as well, the relationship between family. It is an exploration of pain and grief, but those videos that I talked about, the, the jaunty videos are interspersed throughout because that's how life works. And that's what they come to realize is that some of the best moments are often sandwiched between some of the worst moments and the other way around. But as Jamal and Quincy both come to learn, living is more than just the opposite of dying. This story, their story is a story of, of love and life and laughter. It's about the family that we're given versus the family that we choose. Uh, but most of all, this is a story about the parts of us that live on forever and the people that we love. So I hope that you guys all enjoy it. It's a story that definitely is deeply personal. It comes from my heart. There's actually, um, if you want to know kind of a little bit more about the origin, uh, you can find that letter that I wrote um, to accompany the book, the, the early copies online uh, at harpercollins.com. And um, I hope that, that you find uh, those who have experienced grief, we've all lost something or someone important to us. I hope you find comfort and solace in those um, who, who have gotten some distance between the, that loss. I hope that we continue to, to hold those, those ones dear in our hearts. And I hope this story reminds us of the best things in life, the, the people that we meet. Thank you, Justin. Might be hard to follow up on that. That sounds super compelling. I might want to sit with that for a second. Let me say that I think I slipped and said a different H publisher instead of HarperCollins. You did Justin say Hachette, Buck. yes. <laughs> Justin, there's all kinds of publishers. It's okay. No, it's okay. So let's fix that. As you can see on Edelweiss, it's published by HarperCollins. Catherine Teagan books, right? I shouldn't. Did I? Okay. I was going to say, should I trust my memory? Yeah, you, or got no? <laughs> no, you got it. You got it. Okay, great. So we are, let me check where we are. Yep, moving along to our next YA graphic novel. Um, first up is Twins, the first book in a new series. So we're getting in from the ground up. Coming from Scholastic's graphics imprint on October 6th, Twins was written by Varian Johnson, author of several novels for children and young adults, including The Parker Inheritance, which was granted a Coretta Scott King Honor Award, The Great Green Heist, and To Catch a Cheat, a kid's indie next list pick. He lives with his family near Austin, Texas. The Art and Twins is brought to us by Shannon Wright, an illustrator and cartoonist based out of Richmond, Virginia. She illustrated the picture book, My Mommy Medicine by Edwige Danticat, and some of her clients include folks like The Guardian, Time, The New York Times, Mother Jones, NPR, and Google. In a started review, Booklist says Twins is a beautiful reflection of sisterhood and coming of age that belongs in every collection. So please take it from here, Varian and Shannon. Hello. Hey, how you guys doing? Woohoo, good. Varian, you can go first if you want to since we're the only split team. <laughs> All right, I'll start, then I will like toss it to you. Okay, thank you. Well. Um, uh, my name is Varian Johnson, and uh, I am the author of Twins. Um, but before I start, I do want to thank all of the independent bookstores out there. Um, you guys have been um, a huge supporter uh, of me and my career. And uh, we look forward to you guys uh, seeing and reading and hopefully supporting Twins as well, too. I hope you guys love it as much as we do. Uh, twins is about, well, twins, right? Uh, two girls, Maureen and Francine, who have always been together, always joined the same, had the same classes, joined the same clubs, did the same activities uh, until middle school. And now Fran, the older of the two, wants to separate, wants to be her own independent person. And Maureen is struggling with that. 
Um, so the book is all about this exploration of how these two sisters who are best friends are suddenly drifting apart. And what does that mean as how they see themselves and how they see each other? And, and also probably how uh, their world, the school sees them as well. The book was uh, inspired a lot by my own history. I am a twin. This is a picture in the back of the book of me and my sister and my twin brother. Can you guys see that? And, um, and we had the same issue. We uh, were in all the same classes until middle school. And then I really struggled a lot with that separation. Uh, but the book is also inspired by my daughters. My oldest daughter loves graphic novels. She just adores them. She devours them. But we were really struggling to find graphic novels that featured uh, kids of color, um, specifically Black girls. Uh, so this book, you know, very quickly morphed from being a book about me and based on my life into a book that I hope is uh, a celebration of Blackness, Black joy, Black sisterhood, um, all about uh, both these girls and their, their crew around them. Um, and, and with that, uh, when I was talking with Scholastic about the book and we were getting started, we all thought that in order for the book to be the most successful, in order to, um, to make the book what we want it to be, uh, we, I really wanted to collaborate with um, an African-American woman, uh, an artist of color, when, um, when making the book. You know, it is a, a really big collaboration, a lot of back and forth. Um, I really wanted to have a partner who I knew understood what it meant to be a Black girl, who understood Black joy, Black love, um, friendship. Uh, so with that, um, we brought Shannon Wright on board. I am so glad uh, to call her my co-collaborator, and I will kick it over to her. Oh, thank you, Varian. Um, yeah, I, I can't begin to express like how happy I am this mashup took place. Yeah. Um, I kind of didn't believe it because I feel like with everyone, you've gone to a Scholastic Book Fair and you're just like, cool, those books are on the shelves. And now I'm just like, cool, my book is on that shelf <laughs> or will be on that shelf. So um, I really appreciate this uh, collaboration. And yeah, like Varian mentioned, um, we partner up to create something special, uh, twins, which I have kind of like scattered around my whole house. So there's like a book everywhere. <laughs> um, and yes, yeah, so like Varian was talking about, uh, we thought it was important to not only have diversity like take place on the page, but we wanted the creators to also reflect that. So this mashup just seemed just perfect. Um, so when I was creating Maureen and Francine, I, it kind of felt very natural to do so because I just used myself as an example. I used my family members. I used uh, my friends, people I grew up around and just like my community to um, make this world and make these girls come to life. And um, so I, despite them being twins, um, I wanted to make sure their personalities really came through. Um, Varian helped with that, you know, just a little bit about his life and just like, even, even growing up with your own siblings, like you guys aren't exactly the same. So Maureen is very shy, reserved to herself. And then Francine is very outgoing. So despite them being identical, I wanted to make sure their personalities really came through. And yeah, so I like, again, I can't stop touching the book. It's, it's like beautiful. It, it's, it's a thick book full of a bunch of pictures. <laughs> Full color, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I enjoy, I, I, I love comics. I can't talk enough about how much I love comics and how even making this book, I got a, a, a sense of joy out of it because for the first time um, I saw myself reflected and I'm hoping a lot of kids see themselves reflected um, and if little Shannon could see like herself now that, hey, you're drawing comics, you're making comic books, you're making stories, like you're on the front cover of a book that's gonna be in a Scholastic Book Fair. Um, she would probably, she'd probably lose her mind. Um, Cause I know I lose my mind every day as it gets like closer and closer. But yeah, this, this collaboration was great. I, again, I can't thank like Scholastic and Varian 
enough. I know you're cheesing over there, so you cheesing, uh, Varian. Um, I can't thank like my friends enough uh, and just like my community for just, I don't know, believing in me and just believing in me and Varian and I don't know. Books are cool. Books but are cool. Like, you. like, look at the spread that Shannon did. Look at one of these spreads. This is uh, one of the, uh, the cafeteria scene. Look at that, right? This is amazing. And like this, this is like one of our favorite spreads here, right? Of the girls. Um, I mean, it's, it's been, it was a great collaboration and we are so excited about the book. It comes out in a little less than a month and I hope you guys um, read it and appreciate it and support it. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. What a great collaboration. Thank you for sharing all that joy. We needed it. <laughs> Um, our next YA graphic novel, novel is from the author-illustrator Mike Corrado, here to talk about his graphic novel, Flamer, which will be released via Macmillan's Henry Holt Books for Young Readers imprint on September 1st. Mike Corrado is the author and illustrator of the Little Elliot series, which is just visually stunning, so please check that out if you haven't already fallen in love with it. He has illustrated a number of other books for children, including Worm Loves Worm, and Flamer is Mike's first graphic novel. Please tell us more about it, Mike. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for having me today. And I just have to say, I'm so excited for Twins. It looks awesome. I can't wait. Um, so definitely pre-ordering that. Um, so I have a book too. Oh my gosh. Um, and this is my first graphic novel, my first young adult book. Um, and it is called Flamer, um, you know, subtle title, keeping it, um, you know, kind of low key. But um, this is the book that I wrote for my younger self that I didn't have as a kid. Uh, just like what Shannon was saying, like if I could have seen myself in a book, um, sometimes I wonder how much different my life would have been like. Um, and so I, I saw this need and um, I've worked on it for years. Um, and I'm actually gonna share my screen um, so I can show you some of the interiors while I talk. Okay. Here we go. Um, so Flamer is the story of Aiden Navarro, who is a 14 year old um, half Filipino, half white kid at a Boy Scout camp uh, the summer before um, high school. And this is not advancing for me for some reason. Hold on. Ah, well, there's me. The inspiration for my story is my my own story. Um, so this is a work of fiction, but it's very much based on uh, a lot of my experiences. Um, I was kind of a shy, weird kid. I didn't really understand myself growing up. Um, I went to Catholic school. I was a scout from Cub Scouts up to becoming an Eagle and then becoming an assistant scoutmaster. Um, but back to Aiden here. Um, so Aiden is 14 years old, right? And he is at scout camp and he's dealing with um, navigating friendships, bullying, uh, how those two things can overlap sometimes. Uh, racism, religion, body image. Um, he has a bit of a rough home life, um, but he, he does find some some solace being away at camp as well. Um, and, you know, spoiler alert, um, there is a bit of suicide ideation in this book. Um, you know, sometimes, well, I'll just say, it's hard enough being a teenager as it is, right? Um, but when you are also um, a sexual minority or a person of color or both, um, the risks get higher. Um, the Trevor Project, which specializes in um, LGBT youth suicide prevention, um, just released a report. It is actually um, national 
Suicide Prevention Month. Um, and they said that out of a survey of 40,000 um, LGBTQ plus youth, uh, in the past year alone, 40% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered suicide. Um, and more than half of the trans and non-binary people who answered that survey um, considered it as well. Um, one in three were physically threatened or harmed because of their sexual identity. Um, and in general, um, LGBTQ youth are at high risk for not just suicide, but also self-harm and homelessness. Um, so part of the reason for writing this book um, was for those kids to feel seen and for them to know that what they're going through is actually quite normal, as awful as it is, and that there are other people who understand where they're coming from and who want them to be here. Um, and I also wrote this book for non-LGBTQ people to hopefully inspire some empathy and uh, maybe get a glimpse at what it's like to have to walk around with that kind of pressure all the time. Um, there's more of me. <laughs> Snickers break. Um, yeah, I just, I want them to know that I've been there and um, I've been faced with the same questions, you know, uh, especially when I couldn't um, really be myself outwardly and didn't see myself in pages of books or on screens, um, didn't feel safe communicating with other people that I could kind of tell were like me, but avoided because there was danger there um, and even trying to form a community. Um, and I managed to make it regardless. So um, hopefully <laughs> um, this will be a lifeline to some folks. Um, and on a, a bright note, it's received um, some really great um, reviews and endorsements from folks, uh, which I really appreciate. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think uh, what else I want to share with you. Um, maybe a little bit about the process of making it. Um, so this is actually... Um, I let me say you have about 30 to 45 seconds left. Yeah, great. Um, so the artwork is um, colored pencil with ink washes, and it's mostly black and white with um, some spots of um, orange and red. Um, and one more thing I want to share uh, is that I chose to make a graphic novel because comics really share, uh, sorry, comics really saved me as a reader when I was that age. I didn't want to read, um, you know, a book this thick that was only words. Um, my passions with um, pictures and always has been. And um, I just read comics nonstop. So that's the reason why this medium was so important to me. Um, to write this book. So I hope you enjoy it. And thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. There's a lot of a uh, good conversation going on. Joanna Parsaconis, who I believe is in Michigan, right? This book will save lives. Simply having it on our shelves will let youth and our community know that they matter. Thank you for this cover, this title and for making it. So I praise. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that. And I would like to jump in and say um, I miscategorized, or I should more specifically categorize twins as middle grade. Sometimes our title data just says um, juvenile fiction, and you don't really know for sure. So know that that one is middle grade. We are now moving on to adult nonfiction. And I believe that Ariana Davis is in the house. Is that correct? Yes. Um, yes. Well, I didn't quite catch, um, connect with you earlier on. Um, these are two nonfiction titles that I definitely want in my stocking this year. Uh, Hailing from New York City, Ariana Davis is the digital director of O, oh, the Oprah magazine. She previously worked at Refinery29 and Us Weekly, and she has written for the New York magazine, Glamour, Marie Claire, and Pop Sugar Latina. Let's be sure to give her a warm welcome into the book industry. Coming from Seal Press, an imprint of Hachette Book Group, on October 20th, 
What would Frida do as a guide to living boldly? As a huge fan of Frida, I've already pre-ordered it for a friend who could use a little boost. I'm eager to hear more about it, so please jump in, Ariana. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. I, um, as you mentioned, by day, I'm digital director for Oprah Magazine, um, but it's been my honor for the last um, couple years now to be working on What Would Frida Do? Still can't believe I have an actual book to show you guys, but um, get a little of this cover, a beauty. Um, I have been a longtime Frida fan. I, um, as someone who I'm Latina myself, and you know, I think when you grow up as a Latina woman, there are certain icons that you just kind of know automatically, people like Frida Kahlo. Um, but it wasn't until I think I was probably a teenager that I suddenly, and I saw the movie Frida starring Selma Hayek, which I know I'm sure many of you have remember, that was what for me kind of really began this lifelong fascination with this woman who was an artist and is known so much for her art, but also had such an incredibly fascinating life and have been a, life, a lifelong fan, but it wasn't until um, a couple years ago, Seal Press got in touch with me. They were, you know, had been following my work and we talked about working on this book, kind of exploring Frida, the life of Frida Kahlo, but also the lessons that we can learn from her and also just taking a deeper look into why as a culture, you know, so many years after her death, we're still so fascinated by her. If you, everywhere you look, there's Frida, you know, murals, there's Frida t-shirts, there's Frida keychains. I mean, her face has become, you know, even if you don't know anything about art, you know the signature eyebrows or you know the signature floral headdress or you know a little something about her. And um, it was really interesting for me, you know, as a woman of color myself, but also just as a fan of Frida to really dive into her life and the things that we thought we know, but that we didn't know. There were so many surprising nuggets that I learned while working on this book. I think the biggest one for me was just really realizing that during her life, she was very much so in the shadow of her husband, Diego Rivera. She was very much seen as, um, you know, uh, there was an article that I came across in the archives that was like, you know, the wife of master painter dabbles in art. And it very much was, you know, kind of downplaying um, her own self, but still through it all, through her letters, through the interviews that she did, through her own diary, she always believed in herself. She always was very bold. She did an interview once where she said, you know, Diego might be, he does okay for, you know, a little boy, but I am the master artist here. And, you know, this was during a time when Frida was, you know, growing up in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And this was during a time when women were not encouraged to be bold. And here she was as both a woman and also as a Latino woman who was, you know, boldly far ahead of her time speaking up for herself. She also was someone who was unapologetically queer. She was someone who was unapologetically famous and a feminist. And she didn't really use a lot of labels. She just was who she was. And that's a lot. A lot of those things are what I explore in this book, um, the lessons we can learn from that. And also why today, now in 2020, you're on Instagram, you're on Pinterest, you're seeing her quotes everywhere. I think that's because you know, we're in, a, we're in a culture now where we're finally moving towards embracing who people are and really encouraging women's empowerment and encouraging, um, you know, women of color, people of all backgrounds and you know, um, sexualities. And, you know, when we look back at the life of Frida, she was doing that so much, you know, so long ago and so far ahead of her time. So what would Frida do um, is kind of part biography, part self-help in that in each chapter, I kind of dive into a different section of her life, but I also try to just from my perspective as someone who has written in the field of um, you know, women's empowerment and has always strived to make sure that I'm inspiring and empowering women of color for every area of her life. I just really dive into the lessons that I think we can learn from her um, today. And also I think you know, years in the future, she's just one of those icons who I think will always be relevant. And um, for me, I think the highlight of working on this was going to Mexico City for a week and just, I stayed in Coyacan, which is, the area in Mexico City where Frida's from. And I spent a lot of time at La Casa Azul, which is the museum where, um, which is her former house, now a museum. Um, and I just kind of walked, walked around, did research, went to libraries and tried to see the city through the eyes of Frida and really channel what life must have been like for her decades ago. And that I think was for me as a writer, a really important part of the process of just really understanding what Frida's life was like and trying to channel some of that as I was writing this book. So excited for what would Frida do? I hope that the world 
loves it. And I, this book for me was really a love, a love letter and a passion project specifically for women of color who I think now more than ever, as we've seen in the last few months, could use any, you know, boosts of empowerment and love that they can get. And yeah, that's kind of my spiel. October 20th, Via Seal Press. I'm so excited. And also, again, this cover. I mean, can you even? It's, it's, I'm, I'm obsessed. As soon as I saw it, I loved it. Um, I feel like it's just as bright and bold as Frida would have wanted it to be. So yeah, what would Frida do? Excited. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Ariana. That sounds wonderful. Top of my travel list is Casa Azul. So I'll be sure to check with you before I go. <laughs> Make sure you take lots of photos for Instagram. Perfect. Um, next up for adult nonfiction is a New York Times bestselling historian, Judith Flanders, with her book, A Place for Everything, A Curious History of the Alphabetical Order. Judith Flanders is a social historian. Her works include the bestselling The Invention of Murder, Inside the Victorian Home, and The Victorian City. She is senior research fellow at the University of Buckingham, as well as a frequent contributor to the Sunday Telegraph, The Guardian, and The Wall Street Journal. Forthcoming from Hachette's Basic Books imprint on October 20th, Kirkus calls this book Catnip for readers who love language or armchair historians interested in the evolution of linguistics. linguistics. Please tell us some more, of this, more about this intriguing read, Judith Flanders. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm sorry that I'm being published on the 20th of October too. It would appear everyone is being published on the 20th of October. And I think if I were a bookseller, I'd just stay home and pull the covers over my head, but I'm not a bookseller. Um, I came to this very peculiar subject in an equally peculiar way. I read a review of a book, I think about Wikipedia. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I never read the book. I only ever read the review. Um, and in passing, just a single sentence, it said that the author of this book never mentioned that suddenly now encyclopedias didn't have to be alphabetized. And I didn't really think anything about it. And a month or so later, I went to an exhibition of Joseph Cornell. And I realized that his surrealist boxes were also about classifying and organizing. Um, in his case, they were putting things that don't belong together side by side. And when I was walking through the exhibition, I remembered that sentence about Wikipedia, and I began to wonder about organizing and about sorting. And I realized that in our life, we spend most of our life organizing and sorting. We go to the supermarket and the cereal is in one aisle and the milk is in another. Or we separate out the lights from the darks when we do laundry. Or when we read a newspaper, the information about the US Open is on a different page from information about wildfires. All of this is sorting. And so I began to wonder if we had always used the alphabet as our primary sorting method. Is Wikipedia really an innovation? And spoiler alert, no, it isn't. I discovered, of course, as you do, that the history of sorting was much wilder and much weirder than I ever expected it to be. There were sorting systems that I simply would never have imagined. Um, in New England, in colonial New England, um, where you sat in church was predicated on your family's wealth and status. Um, rich people at the front, please. Um, for centuries, um, in large parts of the world, um, children were seated according to their class ranking. So smartest children, front please. And then there was, there was a, you know, before printing, before paper became readily available, um, obviously far fewer things were written down because parchment was expensive. Um, and so, for example, in the English legal system, as late as the 14th century, um, memory, was the important element um, 
in court. You went into court and you swore your oath that your father had told you, that his father had told him that Farmer Brown's land stopped on this side of the road, not that side of the road. And it was only later in the 14th century, uh, in the 15th century, that gradually um, charters and deeds and land acts became the record. Before that, your memory was the record. But of course, once these other paper documents became the record, you had to be able to find them. And suddenly, sorting becomes important. And sorting is really complicated. Um, if most people asked you how bookstores sorted, we would all say alphabetical order, obviously. But it's not true. You don't walk into a bookstore and at the top left, all the authors starting with A are there. Bottom right, all the authors starting with Z, excuse me, Z. Um, it doesn't work like that. If you're shelving my book, and please shelve my book, um, you know, first fiction, nonfiction, then history, then probably under history general, because I imagine you haven't got a glut of books on the history of alphabetical orders. It's probably not a whole shelf. Only then do you get to F and use the alphabet. But the joy of the alphabet and the reason for um, its taking over the world is that it's neutral. You're not saying all the smart children at the front. You're not saying all the rich people over there. You're not saying all the pretty children get on that bus, please. It's totally neutral. It doesn't say how rich our parents are. The only thing it tells us is those people's name begins with an A, those people's name begins with a Q. And that get about 30 to 45 seconds. also means that nobody needs to know anything about you. You don't have to bring any knowledge. You don't have to know about Farmer Brown. You don't have to know about his grandfather. All you need to know is his name begins with B. You can find the document. So the alphabet is the most democratic sorting method that has ever been devised. And that's what makes it so beautiful. Wonderful. We're enjoying this talk about order in front of your beautifully organized office, <laughs> which I relate to. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to let go a little bit here and just realize that we're going to go about maybe five to seven minutes over for this event, and that's okay because you're all delivering such interesting remarks. So we are now moving on to adult fiction, and we have Andrew J. Graff with Raft of Stars. Uh, this next book feels like a Midwest classic in the making with rave reviews from Nicholas Butler and J. Ryan Stradle. Coming from Harper's Echo imprint on March 23rd, this is a 2021 book. Raft of Stars is Andrew J. Graff's debut novel. Stradle, author of The Lager Queen of Minnesota, says the following. Graff has not only crafted an adventure story with a warm heart at its center, but a whole town of characters for readers to fall in love with. Andrew J. Graff grew up fishing, hiking, and hunting in Wisconsin's Northwoods. After a tour of duty in Afghanistan, he earned an MFA from the University of Iowa. He lives in Ohio and teaches at Wittenberg University. So please give us a glimpse into your debut novel, Andrew Graff. Mm, hello. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for loving books. Thank you for taking good care of books. I'm pretty stoked. This is, yeah, my debut novel and I've been after this for a long time and I'm really excited. Um, I'm coming to you from Ohio today. As you mentioned, I teach at Wittenberg University and my wife and I live down here with our, with our four young kids. Um, and I'll just say, um, last night our youngest daughter decided to go like full nocturnal so if I'm slurring my words, I promise I haven't been drinking today. I was just playing with blocks at 3.30 <laughs> in the morning last night. So uh, what, what is Raft of Stars? What kind of book is it? Um, what's it about? And what are my hopes for it? I set out to write a book that I hope um, a whole family might enjoy passing around a lake house someday, you know? Um, at least the teens and adults. I hope that it's, that it's a 
pleasant mix between something that could be considered literary fiction and something more commercial. I, I hope it has literary merit in that it does pay very close attention to the, to the mind and the hearts of its characters. And um, I hope it's really accessible and a very deliberately plotted novel. Um, overall, I just tried to write a really enjoyable adventure that would be nice to read in a, in a hammock. So, uh, Raft of Stars takes off quickly uh, when, when two boys, nicknamed Bread and Fish, think they've committed a horrible crime and are forced to flee into the Northwoods, the northern wilderness of, of Wisconsin. Uh, the boys are pursued by two other casts of characters who are given equal weight and time on the page. The, that first cast consists of one of the boys' grandfathers, Teddy, who is a Korean War veteran and kind of a hardened um, woodsman. The, the book takes place in the, in the summer of 1994. That's sort of my childhood space and territory. And Teddy is accompanied by Cal, the, the, the interim county sheriff, the in, inexperienced county sheriff who's trying to kind of rebuild a life in the North. The other cast of characters pursuing the boys um, consists of one of the boys' mothers, Miranda, who is a very wise character, very capable character, probably the most capable person out in the forest and wilderness. And she is accompanied by um, Tiffany, the, the purple-haired gas station attendant from the small fictional town of Claypot, Wisconsin, uh, who is also an amateur poet. As these three casts of characters move their way downriver um, toward the river's end, toward the novel's climax at a place called Ironsford Gorge. Um, you know, and they're moving through a wilderness that's populated by black bears and coyotes and whitewater rivers and waterfalls and storms and mothers and sons. Uh, all of the characters seem to be wrestling in some way with a, with a shared question. And it's a question that I definitely wrestle with and, sh and share. And I think it's a question that a lot of, a lot of readers, um, particularly nowadays, share. And it's the question of, am I going to make it? You know, <laughs> Am I going to be OK in this uh, community, this week, this cosmos? And um, I think that Raft of Stars, my hope is that it's a novel that answers that and that takes care of the reader's heart by the end of the story. You know, not to give everything away, but it's a, it's a happy ending and readers are saying that it, it, it is um, leaving them with a, with a sense of hope. And I think in this story about characters lost in a wilderness, it's the wilderness itself that seems to kind of whisper back by the story's end and, and, and when it says, yeah, you are gonna make it. One of the refrains from the novel is, uh, is the line, uh, you're strong and you're good and you're not actually alone, so just keep going. Um, a books to grammar, just compared it, because my first books to gram is super exciting. Compared it to uh, This Tender Land by Kent Kruger, and also in terms of how the landscape operates, um, Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. Other people who've been reading advanced copies are um, seeing similarities to some of Jane Smiley's work, which for me is a wonderful compliment. And also, uh, and Nick Butler of Little Faith or uh, J. Ryan Stradle of uh, The Logger Queen of Minnesota. And even though it's a bit of an older book now, I think um, um, the novel Peace Like a River by, by Leif Enger is a wonderful comparison. So I hope that people enjoy reading this book and end up passing it around beach houses and it comes out next March with Echo and I couldn't be happier, and, um, and I look forward to, to working alongside you in any way that I can. If you have any questions moving forward, I'd love to answer them. Please feel free to reach out to me through my website, andrewjgraff.com. I popped it in the chat, and uh, thank you for your time today. And I'm going to follow everyone who speaks today on Instagram and more. If I see your name on the screen, like, look for me later tonight. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. That was just great. Like I said, it really does seem like you're in such great company with your um, comp titles. I'm sure this book is going to do very well. Um, 
that's just a reminder to go ahead and click on those ARC request forms. Um, authors, if you're feeling really motivated by a book or two, feel free to go ahead and well go ahead as well. And remember, ARCs are implicit marketing requests. So as Andrew said, hop online, hop on Twitter, read the book, take the author, say something great about it, and keep the love flowing. Uh, so this event's grand finale is going to be two authors, two fantasy novels from Erewhon, which is a workman company. Uh, these two books were pitched by Liz Hunter in our, in our rep picks session, excuse me, session yesterday. According to the title data, C.L. Polk's book is categorized as adult fiction and Hannah Abigail Clark's is young adult, perhaps middle grade, but I think it's young adult. Uh, so C.L. Polk is the world fantasy award winning author of the critically acclaimed novel, debut novel, Witchmark, which was nominated for the Nebula, Locus, Aurora, and Lambda Literary Awards. It was named one of the best books of 2018 by NPR, Publishers Weekly, BuzzFeed, The Chicago Review, BookPage, and more. She lives in Alberta, Canada, and The Midnight Bargain will be released on October 13th. Please take us there, C.L. Polk. Um, hi, I'm C.L. Polk, and wow, what a bunch of nice things you just said about me. I'm just typing in a, um, a URL manually because I'm on uh, an iPad, and if I leave Zoom, my camera will turn off. So I'm just typing in a little thing for you. Can I jump in for a second? Or maybe you're going to back up. Right now, we can't see your face. Oh, I'm sorry. You're not the only one. Um, it's because I'm lean forward Got it. to type. There we go. Now that I've done that, I will close that. I will lean back. And now you can see me. Perfect. OK. So the link that I just put in is just a, a quick little text adventure game called A Beautiful Day in Mendelton. You can click on that. It'll take you about, I guess, five minutes to go through, and it'll give you a little bit of a um, introduction to the world of the Midnight Bargain. Um, I suppose I should talk a little bit about um, what prompted me to write the book. Um, Honestly, it was an accident. I needed relief in 2019. I was under a lot of pressure. I wanted to have a little fun. I um, was trying desperately to finish a trilogy and uh, write another project that actually didn't work out for me. Um, and I needed to have a break. So I snuck away to write a book that was more of an escape for me. I sat down and I thought about what I would want to write about if I wanted to indulge myself. And I came up with a few things. Um, Georgian style 18th century fashion with the, um, the bodices that made your boobs go up to here and the um, expressive mantuas and beautiful embroidered silk and big hair and hats perched on top of them that were unlikely and fantastical. Um, I also wanted to write about ceremonial style magic rather than uh, wiggle your nose and it's done magic. So um, I came up with um, the idea of a magical system based on spirit summoning. And um, because I was going with my favorites, I went for a really popular trope with historical romance and that's the springtime social season of London. And that was all great, but I didn't have any friction to tell a story about. So it just kind of churned around in my mind until I thought of something terrible <laughs> because of a lot of things that were happening on, in states passing laws in the spring of 2019 that made me think about how um, even today, women still have to make difficult choices about whether or not they're going to choose to devote themselves to a family or they're going to choose to devote themselves to a career and it crossed with a stray thought i thought you know what are the implications of hereditary magic what are the implications if um what makes you a magician is being born with the ability to do magic and i thought oh that's really terrible and then i thought well i want to do spirit summoning so what if the spirits magicians call are dangerous because they don't have a sense of morality. Oh, that's really terrible. And then I was like, but how are they dangerous? And I realized that 
because I had these spirits who were kind of wandering around in a formless void waiting to be called upon by a magician, maybe what they wanted was to experience the material world, to have a body, to eat food, to dance and sing and, and just, you know, be a person, which has a great deal of, of being, the experience of being a person is the experience of having a body. And it all kind of clicked together and I had the main struggle of the book and it had resonance with um, some of the problems that I went through in my life trying to decide whether I wanted a career or whether I wanted a family. And suddenly I had a heroine with a situation that was nightmarish and a choice that meant she couldn't have everything that she wanted from life. So what I wrote is on one hand, a fantasy romance that'll be a great introduction to historical romance readers to the fantasy genre. And on the other, a comment on the choices that women are still making about pursuing their ambitions and career goals while balancing the needs of their families. Um, maybe I should talk a bit about the plot. The Midnight Bargain is a story about Beatrice Claiborne, a woman who's on her way to bargaining season, um, which is where young people gather to find a suitable spouse. And Beatrice could make a very good marriage because she has the power to summon spirits. Um, but once she's married, she'll have to wear a collar that stops her from using any of her magical gifts in order to um, protect any children she might be carrying from spirit possession, which is a terrible thing. Um, so her magic is only valuable in her potential to pass her gift on to her children. And Beatrice doesn't want to lose her magical ability. Um, she'd rather bind a powerful spirit to her service before she's married away and then convince her father to let her help him with his business investments because... Okay, you have about 30 to 45 seconds. Um, okay, because Beatrice's family is in debt. And there's a series of choices that get more and more difficult throughout the book. Um, basically between do I marry this man who is wonderful and I love or do I choose magic and forget all about that forever. Um, I hope that you enjoy the book. I thank you for giving it a try and uh, I'm very glad to be here today. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to make a clarification. I did say Erewhon is a workman company. I didn't mean owned by. I know that they're not an imprint of workmen. It's a distributed situation. So thank you for that clarification. I think it was Elizabeth. Um, we now have our final title for today. And this is from Hannah Abigail Clark. And the book is The Scapegracers. Hannah Abigail Clark is here and queer, etc. They have been published in Lunch Ticket, Prism International, Dream Pop Press, Portland Review, and Gothic Nature Journal, among others. They were a 2019 Lambda Literary Fellow in Young Adult Fiction and a Pushcart nominee. They currently research queerness, labor, and monstrosity in grad school. The Scapegracers is their first novel. According to Jess Zimmerman, author of Basic Witches, The Scapegracers is a jewel-studded book with an unearthly glow. You will definitely want to join this coven. So please take it from here, Hannah Abigail Clark. Uh, rad. Hi, I'm Clark. I use he, they pronouns. Uh, this is a book about lesbian witches who live in the rural Midwest and do lots of foolish things that they probably should have thought about a little bit more than they did before they did them. Um, I wrote this book when I was 19. I was writing from a place of, shall we say, representational scarcity, which I think is probably the case for a lot of us. Um, and I wanted a book about lesbians who are already out, who make stupid decisions, not necessarily revolving around their queerness, but rather because they're on magic adventures and make big supernatural mistakes. Um, Sideways is offered $40 to do some magic tricks at the popular girls party. Popular girls here, like think mean girls, uh, like super stylized, campy, like mean popular teenagers um, who are a little bit more complicated than Sideways initially imagined. Uh, it's really fun and also very much about rage and trauma despite being fun. And I'm excited for you all to read it. And the last one, so I'm gonna keep this short, but uh, yeah, you should, you should give it a go. I think it's a good time.
Well, thank you. You didn't necessarily have to keep it short, but we've still got the definite gist of that book and we will definitely put it on our shelves in our bookstores. Um, so, wow, thank you everybody. This was a bit of a stunner, such a great collection of authors, all with such motivating things to say. Uh, go ahead and click on the three dots on the bottom right if you would like to save the chat, if you didn't happen to request all the galleys. Um, and like I said, go ahead and spread the love and take a little bit of all these stories with you. Thank you everybody for joining us and we will catch you next time. Thanks everybody. Bye.